Good morning, Summit Church. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning, and we are in week two of a series that we're walking through called Life in the Family of God. And if you weren't able to join us last week, what we talked about is how we're brought into the family. What does that look like? And some of the key words and key components that is happening as the Lord brings us into the family of God, as he adopts us as his sons, as his daughters, how he saves us and changes us and all of those things around it. And this morning, we're going to kind of stay in that same vein, but look at it a little bit differently this morning is, what does it look like now that I'm a part of the family? Like, like now that I'm brought into the, what is my role? What is the part that I play? What does that mean for me in my life? And really kind of what's my identity as a son and as a daughter of God? And whenever I think about the word identity, one of the things that I think about is uh, the born identity. There's this movie series that came out Years ago, Matt Damon, he plays Jason Bourne, a CIA agent who has suffered amnesia, and he's trying to figure out just who exactly he is. And the fundamentals of his journey are not really too different uh, than our own as we look at, now, how do I become a part of the family of God? And, and I just want to paint this picture of this scene in this movie. In the mountains of Switzerland, Jason had hitched a ride to Germany with a young woman named Marie. And he's running from the police, but he's not even sure why he's running from them. He tries to keep quiet about his situation until the frustration of it all just overwhelms him. And he responds in asking her a simple question, and he turns to her and says, I don't know who I am or where I'm going. At a truck stop along the snowy highway, Bourne starts to recount what little he knows about himself to her, and he's reaching for clues trying to figure out who he is. And Bourne asks, who has a safety deposit box full of money and six passports and a gun? I come in here and the first thing I do is I'm looking for an exit. I see the exit sign too, but I'm not worried, Marie had said. And then Bourne replied with increased desperation. I, can't, I can tell you the license plate number of all six cars outside. I can tell you that our waitress is left-handed and the guy sitting by the counter weighs 215 and knows how to handle himself. I know the best place to look for a gun is the cab of the gray truck outside and at this altitude I can run flat, ha flat out half a mile before my hands start shaking. Now, why would I know that? How can I know all of that and not know who I am? And that's such an interesting thing and picture, I think, for a lot of us in our relationship to the Lord. We're running, but we don't really know where we're running or why we're running. It's impossible for us to know where we're going until we recognize who we are in Christ and the way that he is leading us and directing, directing us. We find our true name and our true identity in Christ. Christ, and only then can we begin to live the lives that we're called to live. And so as we think about that this morning, I want to help us to see that there's a purpose in all of this, that we have an identity, a true identity that is found in Christ and his redemptive work on the cross and our salvation is in fact a starting point for a life that's going to be transformed by him. And we cannot go forward without that salvation moment, but we are not meant to stay there either. So we're going to look at Ephesians 2 this morning, looking at verses 1 through 10, and I'm going to read through that. We're not going to spend a great deal of time in the first nine verses because we kind of looked at those ideas last week. But let me look at this real quick together. Let's read it, starting in verse 1. And it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That we should walk in them. As I said, we, we studied some of these ideas last week in looking at our 
salvation and, and kind of getting an overview of all that. But I think it's important for us to hear this as well, that the gospel is really, really important, right? It's really important for us. It shapes everything that we do without the gospel, without this message of the first nine verses. None of the rest of those things matter. We have no faith apart from the saving work that Christ has done on our behalf. We can honestly never talk enough about the gospel. Like we can never understand it enough to discuss it and work around it enough to understand and grasp just the fullness of it. Really, it's the main storyline of all of scripture. The main point of the Bible is God's redemptive work through human history. Like time and time again, it's pointing towards the cross, towards the Messiah, towards salvation. And then when that moment comes, it's all pointing back towards the cross, to salvation, to what Christ is doing then and now in our life. It is the starting place that infiltrates every other part of our life. And we have to allow our understanding and knowledge and faith in the gospel that we see in these verses to change our lives, to allow it to shape us and change us. Every person except for Jesus Christ has been dead in their trespasses and sin. As we look at this passage in these first nine verses, that's what it's saying, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, willingly choosing a life of disobedience, willingly choosing their own path and following the way of the world, and ultimately their life then becomes in opposition to God, become enemies of God, because we willingly choose our own path. But God, being rich in mercy and because of his great love while we were yet sinners Christ dies for us and that's so important for us to understand that we did not pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off and then come to God and be like okay I'm ready to to do this or for him to come to say okay now you're clean enough now you're good enough now I'm going to bring you into the family of God no by grace you've been saved as a believer and by placing your faith in Christ, not by anything that you have done. You didn't pick yourself up and dust yourself off and make yourself presentable before Christ. You do not work your way to him. It isn't your good works that brings about salvation so that no man may boast. It's a gift of God. And that's the backdrop for the verse that we're going to focus on this morning that we as people in our own strength and power are helplessly and hopelessly lost apart from Jesus. But because of his great love, because of his great mercy, we have been made alive. And so this is for us believers. If you are here today and do not know the Lord, the first thing that you have to do is to take that step of obedience of putting your faith and trust in him alone. Is the first step of obedience, our first step in our faith journey of trusting Christ to surrender our lives to Him. And so that's the starting point for where we're going to go from this point forward. And so if that's not happened in your life, then even now in this moment, just pray and ask the Lord Jesus, will you save me? Will you forgive me of my sins? I want to make you my Lord and Savior. Again, this is the most important thing that we do, but it's not the only thing. It's not where we end our faith journey. It's where we begin it. And that's where we get to this next verse. For we are his workmanships created in Christ Jesus. The word workmanship there is the Greek word poema, which we get the word poem from. And another way that it could be translated is that it's a work of art or his masterpiece. That we are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus. And we are created in him. We are a part of God's new creation. He talks about in 2 Corinthians that there is a new creation that's coming, that he is working in us and doing things in our lives that he wants us to be a part of. He's transforming us as he's transforming our world. And we have a purpose to carry out in our day. His purpose is to make us more like Christ. That every day we look more and more like him. That's where we get the word 
Christians, that we are little Christ, like that we are representing, taking on the nature and character of who Christ is. And we do that, and it happens in us through the Holy Spirit as we're being transformed and changed from everything that we read up to this moment. As the Spirit begins to work in our life, we begin to look and sound and act and walk more and more like Christ in our life. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we become more like Jesus. And this equipping and this molding and this making that the Spirit is doing in our life is for us to walk here on earth in that power, to walk in the way that He's called us to walk and to carry out the purposes that He's called us to carry out. Too many times we see the salvation moment and we think that's the only experience that we can have and nothing after it ever follows. But that's not the way that it works. Salvation is the beginning to a new life. And the power of the Holy Spirit in us is to then walk in life, is to bring about life in us. No longer living in death and confusion, but now walking in the newness of life, that it is the next steps that we take from that moment forward to carry out the work that God's calling us to carry out. The story of Lazarus illustrates that in John eleven forty four, and he resurrects him from the dead. Jesus then takes him as he comes out of the tomb. Lazarus walks out. He was dead. Now he's alive and he's breathing. And he says, loose him and let him go. In other words, this man is alive. Get him out of those grave clothes and to begin to live his life again. Live his life the way that he's supposed to. To not have to hold anything back. In other words, this man's alive. Get him out. The same power that saved you and took you out of the graveyard, out of that sin, and gave you life in Christ is indwelling you today. To glorify Him, you were made, as we've talked about, as a new creation, and you're still being made new. You're still putting to death sin in our life, still picking up good things that God's called us to do, reading God's Word, learning how to pray more effectively. All of those things with incredible purpose and intimacy, God is working those things in all of us as followers of Christ. And ultimately then, we are created for good works. In all of that, he's creating and molding and putting all of these things into our life so then we can go and carry out the mission that God has for life, these good works in our life. It's like this. We all have a role in the family of God. right? We all have a role just like we all have a role in our family. My family is a stereotypical birth order kids. You know, we have the firstborn, the baby, and the middle child, and each one of them are distinguishable and different in the way that they react to things, the way that they speak, the way that they do the things that they do in their life. Have you ever watched any of those reels about birth order kids? Like, that is them. They carry those out to the, the nth degree, and it's just reality of who they are. It's funny because they have these specific roles in our family dynamics, and if either one of them was different than they are, I don't know if we could function. Right, But they each carry their role specifically as they are supposed to. We all have different tasks in our homes, different things that we manage. We each have different giftings that, that we bring to the table. And spiritually, we're the same way. We are equipped and created and molded into who we are to be, to carry out the role and the gifting in the family of God. And with it, when we walk in those things, when we carry our role in that family, the family thrives. And without it, without you, the church is hindered. It's unable to do what it was being created to do and molded to do. What those things that we are doing, that we are walking in, those tasks, those abilities that God has gifted all of us in, if we pick those things up and we carry them out, then those are the good works that God's calling us into. Right? So we are created for good works. Now listen, there's a distinguish. Uh, we have to distinguish something in this. We're not saved by faith plus our good works. Right? Our good works isn't a part of our salvation. It's not how we're saved. That's legalism. That's false doctrine. You do not work your way to God. He completed the work. And salvation is a gift from God. We just read that a few verses ahead of this. However, we are saved by a faith that works. We are saved by a faith that works. It's not enough to say that we 
have faith, but we must demonstrate that faith by our good works. That's how we are able to see the transformed life that's happening in all of us as we put our hand to the work that God's called us to. The work of the Holy Spirit and salvation that comes is from a faith that's working in us. Right? It's working in us day in and day out. And then also that work in us begins to be a work through us. Okay, It's how we're able to recognize and say, okay, I am a son and daughter of God. I do have the Holy Spirit in me because this is different. My life is different and I'm changed because of it. We cannot be moved and changed by the gospel to then sit and do nothing. Right? The Spirit does not allow it. That's not the way that the Spirit works. He doesn't save someone. He doesn't come into their life and transform them and then just say, okay, now that I've done that, don't do anything. Like, that's not what happens whenever the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and He begins to transform and change our minds, our thoughts, our heart, the way that we see people, our compassion, all of those things. Our life will look different. And it will compel us to to compel us to share the gospel with others. It will compel us to reach out to those who are far away. It will compel us to disciple other people, to show them God's word, to bring them into the family, to bring them to church. Whatever it is, the Spirit will compel us to do things as it's changing us and transforming us from the inside out. It will eventually spill out in our daily life into how we interact with and how we speak to people. If it doesn't, then we're rejecting the Spirit of God in us. It would be if we have this transforming and this working that's happening in our life, but it's not showing up externally in any kind of way, where we're not sharing, we're not inviting, we're not talking, we're not speaking truth and life into others, or the compassion's not there, we're not praying for others, all of those things. If none of that is happening, then we're rejecting the Spirit of God in us and His movement in our life. We talk about this often that we are never meant to be a reservoir. We are meant to be a channel for the Holy Spirit of God. We do not hold the Spirit just to ourselves, but we are a channel that then allows the Spirit of God to flow through us into other areas of our life and into other people's lives. We were created for this and we are being created for this. That is how we're being transformed to do those things. There's a story uh, that is told of a town where all the residents are ducks, right? All the residents are ducks. Every Sunday, the ducks waddle out of their house. They waddle down Main Street to their, sh to their church, and they waddle into the sanctuary. They squat in their pews, and the duck choir waddles in and takes its place. The duck minister comes forward, and he opens up the duck Bible. He reads to them, Ducks, God has given you wings. With wings... You can fly with wings. You can mount up and soar like eagles. No walls can confine you. No fences can hold you. You have wings. God has given you wings and you can fly like birds. And all the ducks shout, Amen. And then they waddle home. <laughs> There's no more time for waddling. Right? We have to put our faith into action. In a lot of ways, this funny picture is a reality of a truth that we sometimes hear, maybe even read, understand what God may be saying and what God may be doing. We don't always recognize or realize all that the Lord has given us. Too often we miss out on who God is creating us to be and seeing that we're a part of just a bigger story that God is telling all around us telling in our world, in our day, and that we have a part to play in it. We hear God's word, or we may hear the message of Christ, but then we don't allow it to, to change us, to take the steps forward that God is calling us to step into. And so I need you to hear me this morning. And you were created for good works. You were. Each and every one of us were. And that we were saved and we were changed and we were made new and the Spirit has come into us and we were a masterpiece of God that He is creating in us new life and giving us steps to take in a part of the family of God. The works 
Paul's writing about here is coming from just a, a, a great place that the Spirit works in us and then through us to produce good works. To produce good works. Too many times we minimize that idea, right? And, and, and it's a safeguard because we don't want to be a works-based in any type of way. But I need you to also understand that we are not saved by good works. We do not perform good works to glorify ourselves, but we do do good works to glorify God. Our good works are a part of the family and growing the family around us. It's to bring a good name to our Father. It to build his reputation. All of this is birthed out of these good works that God is doing in our hearts. They are evidenced of this new birth and creation and testimonies to the changed life that we have in him. There is not a specific thing that I can say is a good work that you were called for because each of us are uniquely made and created for these things. Each one of us have different giftings. Each one of us have different tasks, but we are called into this thing as a whole. What I can tell you is humble submission to God leads us into good works every time. If we'll take our life, right, and, and what he's doing in us, and we allow the Spirit of God to mold us and change us and and transform us if we humbly submit to that and to him and the working of the spirit in our life then good works are going to come out of it they just are you'll find that the conversations that you have are going to look a little different the people who you interact with they're going to happen a little bit different you know what it looks like to lift people up to share the gospel to point to jesus you know those things and when you're walking with God, those things begin to happen in your life. There's a story, and, and they're big things and small things. You know, there's a story that we talked about uh, many times that there is a, a young man who went to a, to a church service and usher saw him and his friend as they walked in. They couldn't find a seat and they were about to leave. And this usher came and got them, found them a seat for them to take a seat and be able to listen to the message. And that night, both of the boys accepted Christ and became followers of Jesus. What was interesting is that one of those boys became the evangelist known as Billy Graham and ultimately becomes like America's evangelist and leads many people to Christ. There are no important acts for God. Each and every one of us have those moments that occur day in and day out in our life. What we're meant to do is to be a channel for the Spirit of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to change us, transform us, and to be available. And that's our role in the family of God. We have these different tasks that we are called into and to be a part of. And you were God's masterpiece, created through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and are still being created in the likeness of Jesus today. And all of that is done so that you can spend eternity with him in heaven, but also so that you can do the work that he's called you to today. Being made more and more like Christ. Our faith in the power of the Holy Spirit produces from our life good works. Begin caring for other people, bringing glory to God, being transformed in this way that no longer living a life of apathy or indifference or dissatisfaction, but a life that's filled with fulfillment as we recognize our purpose and calling in our life. And so this morning, I just want to, to ask you, you know, have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? That was the very beginning question that we had in the first few verses of this passage. Have you recognized your desperate need for a Savior and surrendered to Him? And if not, that's the first step that you need to take this morning is to say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. But if you're here and you have accepted Christ and you do have a relationship with him and you have felt and experienced some of that transformation happening in your life, my question to you is, are you going to submit to his activity? Are you going to allow him to change you and then to be able to carry out and play your part in the family of God. And that looks a whole lot of different ways that we're going to be talking about, uh, especially coming up in the next few months as we're getting ready to, to launch and getting ready to start 
um, meeting on a regular basis, you're going to hear a lot about teams and a lot about, okay, here's where I serve and those different things. And those are all important uh, giftings and things that the Lord has given us. But one thing that is true is that for every single one of us, the main thing will remain the main thing. And that is that we are called to make disciples, every single one of us, to walk in and through this life spreading the good news of Jesus, sharing your story, sharing the testimony, sharing the gospel with those around us and discipling, pouring into them the truths and the reality of who Christ is and how we live differently because of that. That will continue to be what we do and what we're called to, and that's how we're transformed in that to carry those tasks out. But also, you've been specially gifted. Each of us have different gifts and different callings in our life. Some may be called to to help with our children ministry, to be able to pour into the lives of children, to teach them, to 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 shepherd the next generation. For others, you may be gifted in the, the world of music and being able to play instruments, being able to sing, being able to help lead in worship. And we're going to need you and need those things in the coming days ahead. But this morning, all that I want you to do is I want you to sit before the Lord and I just want you to listen to what he has to say. What is it that he's calling you into what is it that he's revealing in your heart what are the ways that that as you think about he's gifted you in this thing i want you to think about if there's people in your life that he's bringing to mind who you need to to share the good news with or need to invite into a discipling relationship and say hey let's get together let's get around the things of god together let's read some scripture together whatever that needs to look like but just allow yourself to be transformed by him. And that's the next step. So once we're brought into the family of God, we have a role in our family. We have a part to play in the family. We're not just brought in and set to the side, but we're brought in and, and begin to take on a part of the family of God. And so as we think about this this morning, I just want you to bow your head and close your eyes. Let's get before the Lord just for a few minutes here. And as you begin to pray and just talk to the Lord there where you're at, I would ask him, he was talking to the Lord, to help you see places in your life, areas in your life, where some of these good works can come out. You know, it could be at your workplace. It could be um, at the school if you're a student. It could be, you know, where you play, you know, where you ride bikes, where you go to the park, whatever it is, where you recognize, man, there are certain people that keep showing up in my life. There are certain things that I see that the Lord has burdened my heart for this person. And I need to step into that with some boldness. You just need to ask the Lord to give you that, to give you that boldness to walk into that. Maybe this morning you have viewed your spiritual life and your spiritual journey as just like a one-time thing and now you are just been coasting, sitting on the sidelines and not really recognizing that you have a purpose or a plan or a role in the family of God. And this morning the Lord's just revealing that to you maybe for the first time and I would just ask that you would ask the Lord to to reveal that to you to show you that you have a part to play and then and then to just submit to him so Lord I'm willing to to do this I'm willing to be transformed by you and so father I Thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the gospel. And I thank you that you have saved us. Lord, you saw us in our desperate need and you saved us from darkness to light, from death to life. Lord, you have given us new life. And we are so grateful and thankful for that. And Lord, I'm also thankful that that's not the end. Lord, that you've transformed us and you've given us this new life and then you are molding us into the likeness of Christ. And Lord, you give us a part to play. You give us a, a future. You give us a path, an identity 
a purpose for our life. Not only to be the, the best that we can be in our, in our jobs, not only to be a, the best that we can be as a father or mother or a husband and a wife, but Lord, you give us a purpose even in all of those things and then in the family. Lord, that we have a part to play in the family of God. You give us a purpose in which to carry that out. And so, Lord, I pray that we would, we would feel that burden and we would carry that out. That we'd be the hands and feet of Christ. And, Lord, I pray that good works would follow. I pray that people would be saved, families would be changed, those who are hurting would find healing. Lord, all of those things would come out of the lives of each person here at the Summit Church in the way that you are working in and through them. And so we just ask you, uh, Lord Jesus, to, to help us. Help us see, help us to know, equip us, give us what we need to see those things happen. And we love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. And like I said, over the next several weeks and months ahead, you're going to start to hear a little bit more about teams and kind of what that looks like. And, and honestly, I'd, I'd be thinking about, you know, where is it that I'm going to serve on a Sunday morning? You know, as we gather weekly in our services, you know, where is it going to be that I'm going to invest my time and energy and, and to see uh, people change by the gospel. And so be thinking about that. Be thinking about what part you want to play in that. And uh, we'll see you next week.